This is White Oak Worship Center in Blairs, Virginia. Our vision is to provide a place for hurting, broken people to find love, forgiveness, and encouragement. A place to help develop people to spiritual maturity through Bible study, training courses, and small group ministries. A place to help every believer discover their God-given gifts, talents, and callings. It's our desire to strengthen families, and to be a blessing to all who come our way. And now, White Oak Worship Center in Blairs, Virginia. You can give a standing ovation for these children this morning. Amen. <laughs> awesome. I love it. Thank you. Thank you, children. Thank you, all, everyone, all of our children's volunteers and workers. The Lord reigns, let the people shout. He reigns in a righteousness. Let the heavens be glad, let the earth rejoice. Come on! The Lord 
despaired I would have despaired some of y'all just put the period at the end of the service right there but he went on he said I would have despaired unless I believe to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living how many you say I've seen the goodness of the Lord right here oh I'm a king's kid I'm a saint of God I'm washed in the blood of Jesus I have an inheritance waiting on me hallelujah wait on the Lord that's what we do that's the Christian life is wait on the Lord. I mean, no, patience is one of the fruits of the Spirit. Fruit of the Spirit, patience. I mean, no, we got to be patient. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage. Stand firm in the Lord Jesus' armor. And He will strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Hallelujah. I believe. I believe in the blood of Jesus. The wash is white as snow. I believe in the power of the gospel. 
still makes the broken whole. I believe that the curse of sin is broken. But when they roll away that stone, yes, I believe, I believe, I believe. As I bow before you, Lord, I will rise in confidence. I will see your goodness, Lord, in the land I live in. of the Lord today. Sing it to the daughters. Sing it to the sons. To every generation. Come on. Look at what the Lord has done. Sing it to the darkness. That's praise. Let the light has come. Oh. Sing it to the nations. Look at what the Lord has done. Sing it to the darkness. Look at what the Lord has done. Sing it to the darkness. Yes, that the light has come. Oh, sing it to the nations. Look at what the Lord has done. Sing it to the daughters. Sing it to the sons. To every generation.
more time say belong to you father we're in the world but we're not of the world come on let's just begin to praise him let's begin to worship him our desire is to be like him our desire is to be with him our desire is to be for him our desire is that he would rule and reign in us yes Jesus joy of my desire Dear to me. 
says but of the day and that hour knoweth no man no not the angels which are in heaven neither the son but the father take heed everybody say this next word with me watch watch and pray for you know not when the time is for the son of man is a man taken of a far journey who left his house and gave authority to his servants and to every man his work, and commanded the porter to, say this with me, watch. Verse 35, say this word with me, watch ye therefore, for you know not when the master of the house cometh, at even, or at midnight, or at the cock crowing, or in the morning, lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. And what I say unto you, I say unto all, watch. I think I'll title the message today, Watch. Lord, thank you for the reading of the word. Thank you for the anointing on your word. Let it go forth. May it minister to your church today, dear God. This message is to the church. And may each and every one of us be watching and praying and anticipating your soon return. Now use us in these next few minutes and we'll thank you for all you do. In Jesus' name we pray and everyone in agreement shout it. Amen. Amen. How many of you in this house today know that God's got a secret? How many of you know that God's got a secret? You mean he's got something he's not telling me about? Huh? He's got a secret. The Bible tells us that the angels do not know, and it tells us that his son Jesus doesn't know either. The only one who knows is God the Father. He knows, amen? You know, he's the only one that knows when he's going to tell his son, my son, go bring my children home. Amen? We don't know the day, we don't know the hour, but you know what? The Father does, and He has a secret. And you know, I think every Christian with a rational mind really believes that the Lord is coming. Now, there are some people who have fallen out of heart. There are some who, and you may be here this morning, and you've said this, I've heard that all my life. He hasn't come yet. Amen? Well, think about it. It's over 2,000 years ago He told His people He was coming back. And they were looking then, and we're looking now, and he hasn't come. But you know what? Never has there been a time like we see today. And we will elaborate on that as we get into this message this morning. But I think that most every Christian thinks that Jesus is coming. Did you know there's always been those who tried to predict the coming of the Lord? They did. I read this years ago. There was a woman uh, who lived in San Francisco, California. Her name was Elizabeth Steen. And she had a following of 10,000 people. And she got them all together, and she told them that on April the 14th, 1969, that Jesus is coming back. These 10,000 people, she led them up on a mountain, Pastor Cabell, and they were all there waiting for the Lord to come on April the 14th, 1969. Guess what happened? The Lord didn't come. And you know what? She was a false prophet. There's another man by the name of Smith who had a radio broadcast. Daily, he was on the radio every day, and he predicted the coming of the Lord was going to be on a certain day. He had all of these people. They were all believing this is going to be the day. He's coming on this day. We all got to get ready. Well, that day came and it went. And, you know, Jesus didn't come. And he went and he hid in embarrassment. What are you saying, preacher? I'm saying that only God the Father knows when Jesus is coming back. You ever get around somebody and they tell you, I know when Jesus is coming. The day they're lying because they don't know. Jesus doesn't know when he's coming back. But, you know, the early church, as I look at the early church, the early church was not looking for a hole in the ground. They were looking for a hole in the sky. They really were. That's what they were looking for. They were looking for Jesus to come back. Some Christians, you know, all they talk about is dying. You ever get around somebody, all they want to talk about is dying? Well, I'm telling you, the early church folks, they were looking for the coming of the Lord. They weren't looking for dying. They were looking for the coming of the Lord. In spite of all the persecution that the early church went through, that guess what? They still brought comfort one to another when they would greet one another. You know what they would say? They would walk up to one another past the cabal, and they would greet them with a holy kiss. Don't worry, I ain't coming down there and kiss you. But they would greet them with a holy kiss. And you know what they would say? They would say, Maranatha, 
What does that mean? It means the Lord's coming back, amen? Or come quickly, Lord Jesus. That's how the church greeted one another. Maranatha, the Lord's coming. Well, if you did that today, you know, people say, oh, shut up. You know, that's about the time you and I are living in. But God still has a secret, and the, the signs tell us, folks, that it cannot be long until Jesus comes back. In Luke's gospel, the word tells us in chapter 21 and verse 29, let me read this to you from the NLT. It reads like this. Then he gave them this illustration, Jesus did. Notice the fig tree or any other tree. When the leaves come out, you know without being told that summer is near. How many of you understand that? When you see a tree begin to bud, you know good weather's coming, right? We know it's not going to be long. He goes on to say in the same way, when you see all these things taking place, you can know that the kingdom of God is near. Jesus went on to say, I tell you the truth, this generation will not pass from the scene until all these things have taken place. Amen? This generation is not going to leave until all these things have taken place. Heaven and earth will disappear, but my words will never disappear. And then he says in verse 34, everybody say this with me, watch out. Watch out. Say it loud, watch out. Yeah. Don't let your hearts be dulled by carousing and drunkenness, by the worries of this life. Don't let the day catch you unaware like a trap. For that day will come upon everyone living on the earth. Keep alert at all times and pray that you might be strong enough to escape these coming horrors and stand before the Son of Man. Watch out. Don't let your hearts be dulled by the things that are happening. You know, we're living in a time, and I've been saying this for quite some time now, I believe that the church as a whole is going through a, a great falling away. And I believe that there are a lot of Christians, their heart has become dull. I mean, you know, if you walk up to them and say, Maranatha, the Lord's coming, they look at you like that strange look. I've heard that all my life. I don't want to hear that. That's what happens, folks. But we can't allow that to happen to us. Amen? We've got to continue to look for the coming of the Lord. So God has a secret, and signs tell us that it can't be long. Matthew 24, 7 says this, his coming is going to be like lightning. It's going to be like lightning. When the lightning flashes, that's, that's how the coming of the Lord is going to be, the Word tells us in Matthew 24, 27. What are you saying, preacher? I'm saying you're not going to have time to catch up on your tithes. Come on. You're not going to have time, gentlemen, to go and apologize to your wife for the things you've said. Wives, you're not going to have time to apologize to your husband. Children, you're not going to have time to apologize to your parents because you were disobedient to what they told you to do. Amen? See, the best thing to do is get it right with God. And the best thing to do is live right every day. Not just on Sunday, but live right every day with that expectation. This could be the day that the Lord comes. Amen? Look at verse 34 of our scripture text here. Notice what it says in verse 34. It says, for the Son of Man is as a man taking a far journey. Did you get that? Like a man taking a far journey. You know what? Jesus took a far journey. He says, it's expedient unto you that I go away, for if I go not away, the Comforter will not come. Jesus went back to heaven. He sent the Holy Spirit to comfort us. Amen? But you know what? He also told us that he's coming back. It's like every bridegroom that's getting ready to get married. He, he wants to provide a place for his wife, a home for his wife once he gets married. Well, Jesus wants to provide a house for you and me. That's why he went into heaven. In John 14, most all of you know it. Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. If you believe in God, believe also in me. For in my Father's house are many mansions. And if it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. If I go to prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you may be also. Thomas said, Lord, we know not whether thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus said, I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. How many of you know that our Lord has gone to prepare a place for us? I've seen people get bent out of shape. They say, I don't believe the King James Version there that everybody's going to have a mansion. If you look at the original, it says we're all going to have a room. Well, how many of you know the room's going to be in the mansion? <laughs> How many of you be satisfied with a room in the mansion? Can I get a witness out there? Hallelujah. He's gone to prepare a place for us. And we understand that. And look at verse 34 once again. Look what it says here in verse 34. It says here, it says, For the Son of Man is as a man taken of our journey who left his house. And notice what he did. He gave authority to his servants. Did you get that? How many servants of the Lord are in this place today? Did you know what? Jesus gave authority to his servants. How I many of you know we have authority? 
I love Mark 16, 17, and 18. Jesus said, these signs shall follow them that believe. He says, in my name they shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. If they drink any deadly thing, it shall not harm them. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. How many of you know God has given you and me authority? And we've got to begin to walk in that authority. What did he say? He said, these signs shall follow them that believe in my name. They shall cast out devils. How many of you know when you walk in the Holy Spirit, when you get up in the morning, you give the devil a nervous breakdown? He doesn't even want to get around you. Amen? How many of you know that we can, we can command the enemy to go and he has to go in the name of Jesus? It's not because of who we are. It's because of that Jesus that lives on the inside of us. It's because of the authority that he's given us over principalities and powers and with the wickedness of the, of the enemy. He says, in my name, you cast out devils. He said, you shall speak with new tongues. I'm thankful for Pentecost. Jesus said, I got to go, but I'm sending the comforter. And I'm thankful that that day, listen, it wasn't just for that day only. It's for every believer, every believer to be baptized in the Holy Ghost and fire that gives you power for service. That's the language God understands when we're praying in the Holy Ghost. Come on, you never can pray a selfish prayer, pray out of the will of God. When you're praying in the Holy Ghost. He said they'll speak with new tongues. He said they'll take up serpents. Now I want you to know something. We ain't got a box of snakes sitting in here. Where's that box over there? Somebody, they used to always get upset when they come. Would Mike, pick that up and come out here with that, would you please? Watch that big one in there, though. Be real careful with that. Yeah, bring them on over here. See, visitors, when they come here, they look over and they see that and say, My God, what's in there? This ain't one of them snake handling churches, is it? You can take it back now. No snakes. As a matter of fact, if someone brought one in here, I'd be saying, where is it you might want a door? Are you listening to me? What do you mean? You remember when Paul, a viper, came out and latched a hold, uh, got, a, got a hold to his hand? You remember that? The Bible tells us he shook it off in the fire. Well, they all were standing around looking at him, watching. Is he going to swell up now? He's going to drop over dead? That snake, you know what didn't bother him one bit? That's where the word talks about you take up serpents. I've told this story about my grandparents, uh, Willie and Emma. They used to have a, anybody, got, anybody here raised chickens? You got a chicken house. There's a few chicken houses around. Hey Amen. Not many as much as it used to be. If you got fresh eggs, come see me. I'll take them off your hands for you, okay? But, but granny and grandpa, they had a chicken house. And my grandmother, she'd go down to get the eggs. And she would go down and she'd get the eggs out of the nest and she I've heard her tell this story. She said, I put my hand down in this nest. And she said, I felt something cold and slimy. She said, I eased my hand out and I went back to the house. And she said, I told Willie, I said, Willie, I was down there getting eggs out of, out of the hen house. And I felt something. And when I put my hand in that nest, I felt something that was cold in there. My grandfather said he went and he, he got a pitchfork. And he went down there and said he looked at that nest and he moved the straw back. When he did that, old snakes come up like he was going to strike him. Granddad said he used that pitchfork and sent him. He said he went on to be with the Lord. That's what he said, you know. <laughs> How many of you know that's the way we handle snakes? Can I get a witness out there? So he said, you shall take up serpents. And then he said, if you drink any deadly thing, it shall not harm you. If you've ever been on the mission field... You know there are things that you eat and things that you drink. You know, that oh, it's just a miracle I'm still here. It's a miracle Pastor John Hansen is still living. Because I've been to Haiti on probably 50 occasions since 1985. And, and you know, we've been out there and, and John would hand something to me to eat. And I'm getting ready to eat it. And I look over at Sister Joyce and she'd go. Don't, don't do that. I mean, he would eat stuff that'd make a billy goat puke. Gail, am I right? That's the truth. And still live to tell about it. Old Frankie ate some stuff down there. He saw John eat one day like the died. Amen. But I, that's what it's talking about. If you drink any deadly thing, it shall not harm you. He said, listen, these signs shall follow them that believe. You shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Wouldn't that be wonderful if that was true? It is true. Amen. God has given us authority. Verse 34 says, Jesus gave authority to his servants. The word says, I love this in Luke 10, 19. It says, behold, Jesus said, I give unto you power. Everybody say power. Power to tread upon serpents and scorpions and over all the power. Everybody say power. 
of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. In this verse of scripture, we see in English the word power two different times, but in the Greek, it's two different words. It says, listen what he says, behold, I give unto you power. That word is exousia, which simply means authority. He says, I give unto you exousia, power, authority uh, uh, to tread upon serpents and scorpions and over all the power. The Greek word there for power is the word dunamis, and it means ability. Amen. Ability of the, over the enemy and nothing shall be any means harm you. In other words, what he's saying, God's given us authority over the devil's ability. Come on. The devil has the ability to kill. He has the ability to steal. He has the ability to destroy. And he will, allow, he will do to you what you allow him to do. But when you put your foot down and you say, as Popeye said, that's all I can stand and I can't stand no more. When you walk by faith and you put the devil in his place, he's got to go. So God has given us authority over the devil's ability. Amen? Hallelujah. Authority. I think about that word authority. I was telling him in the first service. The thing I love to see, you, you, you see it too. You see a little woman. She weighs about 90 pounds. She's got this uniform on and a whistle in her mouth. And she walks out in the middle of traffic, and she throws her little bony hand up like this. And all the traffic comes to a screeching halt. Why? Because she has authority. She, she has authority to tell those cars to stop because these little kids are going to walk across to go to school. Amen? Isn't that amazing? That's authority, folks. And you know what? God has given you and me authority. Amen? The Lord, when he went away, he says he gave us authority. Jesus gave authority to his servants. And we got to understand this. I think about in Acts chapter 3, it talks about how that Peter and John went to the temple. And when they went to the temple, the Bible tells us that there was a man who was crippled from his mother's womb. He was there begging for money, begging for money. And Peter looked at him and Peter said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, give I thee in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. And he took him by the hand. The man had never walked. Strength came to his legs and his ankles. And you know what? The word says he went to church with them that day. The word says he was leaping, he was shouting, and he was praising the Lord. How many of you know he broke that church service up that day? Man, nobody could keep him quiet. No, he probably took about three laps around the place. What are you saying, preacher? I'm saying God gives authority. Amen. The man... He, had a, he, he got real emotional. He did. He got real emotional. You know, there, there are some who, who say, I just don't believe in that emotionalism. Huh? I mean, there's some go to church and if somebody says amen, they look back, see who said it. Come on. Right? If you fill out a place among, among God's people worshiping and praising God, you're going to fill out a place if you get to heaven. Amen? So there are those, you know, they don't believe in emotionalism. But you know what I found out? I found out the majority of people say, I don't believe in all that emotionalism. They'll go to the baseball game, basketball game, football game, golfing, they'll, and they'll fall out of the bleachers going crazy over their team. Some of you right now, you say, mm, that's me. You come to church and you're like this. Hello? Am I preaching the truth? You know what? We see a sinner come to God. We get excited, and they call us a fanatic. Hello? If a fan, you know, can get so excited over a ball game, how many of you know we can become fanatics for Jesus? Can somebody say amen? How many of you know it's all right to clap your hands? It's all right to shout hallelujah. It's all right to stand up and dance before the Lord with all that's within you. It's all right to take a lap if you feel like taking a lap. It ain't going to hurt you. Mama Joyce, am I preaching? Thank you, honey. Amen. How many of you know that we have authority over finances? In Acts chapter 4, the word says in verse number 32, now look, look, at, look with me here. It says this, and I'll read it to you from the New Living Translation. It says, all believers were united in heart and mind, and they felt that they owed, they, they, and they felt that what they owned 
was not their own. How many of you know that everything we own is not our own? Hello? How many of you know that every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of light? We don't, how many of you know that you cannot have a U-Haul hooked behind your hearse? Hello? You're not going to take it with you. And this is what they said. They, the early church, they felt that what they owned was not their own, so they shared everything they had. The apostles testified powerfully to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and God's great blessings was upon them all. Listen to what it says. There were no needy people. How many of you know if the church world did what, it was, what it's supposed to do, we wouldn't have Social Security? Everybody would be taken care of, right? This was the early church. There were no needy people among them. Why? Because those who owned land or houses would sell them, and they would bring the money to the apostles to give to those in need. For instance, when uh, there was jo Joseph, the one apostle nicknamed Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. He was from the tribe of Levi, and he came from the island of Cyprus. Listen to what he did. He sold a field that he owned, and he brought the money to the apostles so that there would be no needy people there. You know, Barnabas, many Bible scholars believe that Barnabas was the rich young ruler. You know, when Jesus looked into his heart, and, you know, he said, I've kept all these commandments from a youth on up. And the Lord said, what? Sell all that you have and give it to the poor. And the word says he walked away. Well, many of them believe this is the same man who came to himself. Amen? And you know what? He was used of God. He was certainly a, a, a man of encouragement, and he was used of God to help those who were in need. What are you saying, Brother Roger? I believe, I believe today that God will take care of our finances. Amen? How many of you know these are trying times we're living in? They really are. I mean, every time I pull up to the gas station, Ken, I, you know, I, 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 get, I put that nozzle down in, in, in my, to, to fill my car up, and I feel like shouting, somebody call 911, because I feel like I just got robbed. How many of you know what I'm talking about? How many of you ladies been to the supermarket lately? Huh? Isn't it amazing what you, what, what you used to could get, you know, is almost double now in some cases. I mean, you know... I, you go over, Ron, you go over to, to, to McDonald's, they don't have a happy meal anymore. They got an unhappy meal. <laughs> Hello? I mean, you can't even get happy with a, with a happy meal when you look at what you have to pay for. Can I get a witness out there? The, these are trying times. But in the early church, neither was there any among them that lacked. Amen? The Word tells us there were no needy people. All the needs were met. What are you saying? I'm saying that God can take care of our finances. God is our provider. We don't own anything. Everything we have is borrowed. Even the breath that's in your, in your lungs is borrowed. Amen? I mean, we got people coming out of the seams today. But how many of you know God is still the same? He's still the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is. I read a story years ago about this preacher and his wife. They were so concerned about folks who were homeless. So they went down in the bad part of town. They opened a little mission down there. And what they were doing, they got the opportunity because they tried to take care of the needs of the homeless. They, they won the opportunity to preach to them. It's like Pastor John in Haiti. How does he win the opportunity to preach to all those folks in Haiti? He takes care of their needs. He gives them food. He gives them clothing. Amen. He takes care of their, their physical needs. They have a clinic where they come in and help them. And you know what? He, all of that that he did, he won their confidence and the opportunity to preach the gospel to them. Well, that's the same way that it happened with this little mission. They were feeding the people. And, and what they were feeding them was fish sticks because that's all they had. Fish sticks every day. Fish sticks, fish, fish sticks, fish sticks. After a while, the preacher's wife said, if I have to eat another fish stick, I think I'm going to grow gills. She said, we can't eat this no more. His wife said to him, he said, you preach that God's going to supply our needs. Let's pray for hot dogs, hamburgers, or something else. I can't eat any more of these fish sticks driving me crazy. But the, in the story, the word says that, that she prayed. She prayed. And a man who was a drunkard got saved in that mission. And his brother saw what happened to him. He was so excited, he came to the preacher, and he said, preacher, he said, I own a meat market. He said, do you have a freezer? And the preacher said, yeah. 
He said, well, would you be offended if I stock it for you? Said he filled up that freezer with hamburgers, hot dogs, chicken, bacon, anything you can think of, steaks, T-bones. He filled that, that thing up. And you know what? He, he, the wife, she said, you know what? If God can fill a freezer, he can fill a church. And you know what? They built a church and God blessed because inspiration came, folks. Just the knowledge that God hears your prayers and comes to your rescue and meets that need is such a beautiful thing when we see what God does. And it builds our faith. And she got her faith built up because she didn't have to eat no more fish sticks. Can somebody say amen? Amen. <laughs> amen. By the way, as we look at the early church, how many of you know that the early church they had some folks in the church who were hypocrites. Now, I know that we don't have any in our church that are hypocrites, and I know that the church in America, there is no hypocrites in the church in America. And if you believe that, I have a bridge I'd like to sell you. Amen? But we see a perfect example of this in Acts chapter 5. The word says here in verse number 1, NLT reads it like this, but there was a certain man named Ananias who with his wife Sapphira sold some property. He brought the part of the part, everybody say part of the money, to the apostles claiming it was the full amount. With his wife's consent, he kept the rest. Now, Peter said to Ananias, why have you let Satan fill your heart? You lied to the Holy Ghost and you kept some of the money for yourselves. The property was yours to sell or not to sell. As you wished, it was yours. And after selling it, the money was also yours to give away. How could you do a thing like this? You weren't lying to us, but you were lying to God. Nobody twisted your arm and told you you had to sell that piece of property. And nobody twisted your arm and, and that you had to give it all to the church. But this is what you said you were going to do. Amen? Now, as soon as Ananias heard these words, he fell to the floor and he died. Everyone who heard about it was terrified. Then some of the young men got up and wrapped him in a sheet and took him out and they buried him. About three hours later, his wife came in. Not knowing what had happened, Peter asked her, was this price you and your husband received for your land? Yes, she replied, that was the price. And Peter said, how could the two of you even think of conspiring to test the spirit of the Lord like this? The young men who buried your husband are outside the door and they're going to carry you out too. Instantly, she fell to the floor and died. And when the young men came in and saw that she died, they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And great fear gripped the entire church and everyone who else who heard what had happened. See, these folks held out on God. They lied to the Holy Ghost is what they did. And they, would not, they wouldn't give like other people did. You know, they wanted to ring a bell. They wanted everybody to think, look what they gave. And then they kept back part for themselves. They lied to the Holy Ghost. Fear came upon the church. How many of you know if we saw a couple come up here and drop dead, I think a little fear would come in white oak. Do you believe it would? I believe so too. People got afraid of this business of lying to God. And you know what? When we tell, we're go tell God we're going to do something, how many of you know we better do it? We better do it. Also in the early church, they had authority over sickness. Here in Acts chapter 5, look with me here in verse number 12. It says, And by the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders. They say signs and wonders. And they were wrought among the people, and they were all with one accord on Solomon's porch. And, all, all, and of the rest durst no man join himself to them, but the people magnified them. And the believers were more added to the Lord, multitudes, both men and women, insomuch that they brought forth the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and couches that at least the shadow of Peter passing by might overshadow some of them. There also came a multitude out of the cities round about into Jerusalem, bringing sick folks with them, which were vexed with unclean spirits. And notice what they said, and they healed every one of them. Did you get that? They had authority over sickness that even the shadow of Peter cast upon them. People were healed. This is what took place in the early church. The early church also, they had authority to open prison doors. Amen. Peter and the apostles had been cast into prison. Look at verse 17 right here in Acts chapter 5. It says, Then the high priest rose up, and all they that were with him, which is the sect of Sadducees, were filled with indignation. And they laid their hands on the apostles, and they put them in a common prison. But the angel of the Lord by night opened the prison doors and brought them forth and said, Go stand and speak in the temple to all the people the words of this life. In other words, the Lord just brought them out of prison. Come on. 
And the, here they are. God said, the Lord says, go down there and preach the word. You know, a lot of people get out of prison. They said, let's get out of this town so they don't catch us again. No, man. They went down there and they started preaching to all those people again. Amen. They had authority. Authority over prison doors. Look at verse 34 of our scripture text. Look what it says here. It says, for the Son of Man is a man take, as a man taking a far journey who left his house, gave authority to his servants. And notice this, and to every man his what? His work. To every man his work. How many of you know that God has given us authority? Whatever God has called you to do, he's given you authority in it. Amen? If you're a prayer warrior, how many of you know he's given you authority to come against the gates of hell? He's given you authority to call the things that are not as though they were. He's given you authority to overcome the principalities and the powers of the enemy. He's given you so much authority you can give a devil a nervous breakdown. Amen? If it's in music, Lee, he gives you authority to usher the people from the outer court to the inner court to the holy place. Come on! That's what, that's what the Lord does when he anoints us to do what he's called us to do. To preach. If you're anointed to preach, guess what? He's given you authority authority to preach under the, uh, the unction of the Holy Spirit to see lives touched and changed for time etern and eternity. He gives authority to every man, whether it's witnessing or whether it's teaching or whatever work God's called you to do, he will anoint you to do what he's called you to do. It also says here in verse 34, listen to what he says, to every man his work, and he commanded the porter to watch. Everybody say watch. He commanded the porter to watch. David said this, he said, I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. Amen, a porter, I'd rather be a porter at the door than to dwell in the tents of the wickedness. Amen. This is, we see, authority is given to every man, to the porter to watch. We're all to watch. We're to be watchmen. In Acts chapter 12, listen to this now. In Acts chapter 12, beginning in verse 1, this is about that time King Herod Agrippa, he began to persecute some believers in the church. He had the apostle James, John's brother, killed with a sword. When Herod saw how much it pleased the Jewish people, he also arrested brother Peter. He arrested Peter. He, this took place during the Passover celebration. Then he imprisoned him, placing him under the guard of four squads of four soldiers each. Herod intended to bring Peter for public trial after the Passover. But while Peter was in prison, I love this, the church prayed very earnestly for him. How many of you remember when you were in prison? Some of you said, I've never been in jail, Brother Ewing. Huh? Yes, you were. If you're born again, you was in prison. Devil had you bound. Come on. He had that yoke of bondage upon you. He had you shackled and handcuffed. Come on. How many of you remember when you were in prison? But somebody prayed for you. Somebody rang the prayer bells of heaven. Somebody called your name out to God and said, Lord, convict them. Convince them. They need you. Well, Peter's in prison. And while Peter's in prison, the church prayed. Verse 6 says, the night before Peter was in a was to be placed on trial. He was asleep fastened with two chains between two soldiers. Others stood guard at the prison gate. Suddenly there was a bright light in the cell and an angel of the Lord stood before Peter and the angel struck him on the side to awaken him and said, quick, get up. And the chains fell off his wrist. Then the angel told him, get dressed, put on your sandals. And he did. Now put on your coat and follow me, the angel ordered. So Peter left the cell following the angel. But all the time, he thought it was a vision. He didn't realize he was, this was actually happening. He thought, this is a vision. I'm having a dream. This isn't really happening. The word says they passed the first and the second guards post and came to the iron gate leading to the city. And this opened for them by itself. It just opened up by itself. So they passed through and started walking down the street. Then the angel suddenly left him. The angel left. The word says that Peter finally came to his senses. And Peter said this, it's really true. The Lord has sent his angel and saved me from Herod and from what the Jewish leaders had planned to do to me. This thing is true. The Lord led me out. Verse 12 says this, when he realized this, he went to the home of Mary, the mother of John Mark, where they were gathered in prayer. Folks, there was a prayer meeting going on. 
You know what they were praying? Oh, God, please deliver Peter out of that prison. You know what they're going to do to him when he goes before that judge tomorrow. Lord, they're going to kill him. Oh, God, please deliver our brother Peter out of that jail. Well, the word tells us he went to the home where they were gathered in prayer, and he, he knocked on the door. In the gate, a servant girl named Rhoda came and opened it. And when she recognized Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed that instead of opening the door, she ran back inside and told everyone, Peter is standing at the door. God has heard your prayers. Oh, men and women of faith and power. Huh? But listen to this. They said, you're out of your mind. I think it was paste and flour instead of, huh? Faith and power. It says, they said, you're out of your mind. When she insisted, they decided it must be his angel. Meanwhile, Peter continued knocking. I tried to wake some of y'all up out there. Continued knocking. And when they finally opened the door and saw him, they were what? They were amazed. They, it, just blew them, it just blew them away when they saw what had happened here. Come on. Are you listening to me? We see here the authority, folks, was given. God gave authority. And, and you know, the Lord let them out of that prison. And these people, instead of saying, oh, thank you, Jesus, they said, are you mad? Are you crazy? No way. See, you know, we ask God for things and we put roadblocks up today. We really do. We do the same thing they did. We ask, oh, God, do this, do this, do this. When he does it, we're, we're, we're amazed. I can't believe he did it. <laughs> Anybody ever prayed a prayer and God did it and you said, I can't believe he did it? Huh? This is the same thing that happened. Now, look here in verse 35 of our scripture text. We're coming to a close, so this is going to help somebody, knowing that we're coming to a close. <laughs> verse 35, he says what? Watch. Everybody say it. Watch. Watch ye therefore, for ye know not when the master of the house cometh at even or at midnight or at the cock crowing or in the morning. Amen. Did you get that? Watch. Watch. You know, I was telling him in the first service, being pastor here for 43 years, I've done a lot of weddings over the years. How many of you I've married out there? Raise your hands. There's a bunch of you out there. I've married bunches of folks over the years. I've done lots of weddings. And, you know, one thing I've always watched at you know, when that, when that bride, when she steps through those doors or out in the field, <laughs> times, times have changed. Used to be, you know, we built a brand new church for people to get married in. A lot of times people didn't get married at the old church. They said, I, I like a center aisle. We, had, we didn't have a center aisle. I like a center aisle. But a lot of folks now get married out in the field. That's all right. I've done plenty of weddings in the field, but, but it's kind of funny, you know. But I've always looked at the groom. When that bride steps forth, those doors open, the music starts playing. You know, I look at that, I look at that groom, and I, I, I look at the, you know, I can almost read his thoughts. He's saying, she's beautiful. This is the greatest day of my life. You know, you can read that on his face. But, you know, he doesn't understand. He doesn't understand that he will no longer be free. He doesn't understand that grace will depart and he'll be living up under the law. Can somebody say amen? But you know what? He doesn't know it. You know why? Because he's in love. He's in love. It doesn't matter whether grace has departed. He'll be living under the law. It doesn't matter whether he'll lose his freedom. He just at the moment, this is the greatest thing that's ever happened to me. Amen. You know, I believe that's the way God wants his church to, to look skyward. How many of you know there are so many distractions in the world? There are so many things the devil uses to try to get our eyes off the Lord, eyes off the coming of the Lord. Amen? But you know what? I just believe with all of my heart that God wants us to look up because our redemption draws nigh. I believe he wants to do that. I believe he wants us to be ready when he comes. I really believe that. You know, I just wish that people would stop playing church. I really wish people would stop playing church. 
I mean, there's people that come to church and you never walk through the doors of this church to worship God. You just came to do your duty, to soothe your conscience, to make you feel better. Amen? I wish people would stop doing that. I wish people would get excited about God. I just wish every one of you would become a raging fanatic for Jesus. Can I get a witness out there? I don't know about you, but I'm glad I'm in a spirit-filled church where the Holy Spirit moves. I, I, I'm glad we're in a place where the Spirit of God is moving and people are getting saved on the altar. And we see signs and wonders and miracles. I'm glad I'm in a church like that. Amen? And you know, I believe that God is trying to get the church ready to meet Him. In our scripture text, look at verse 35. Watch ye therefore, for you know not when the master of the house cometh at evening or at midnight, when the roosters crow in the morning. And then the next verse says, Lest coming suddenly he finds you sleeping. Sleeping. You know, I understand. Well, preacher, you know, you can only, your seat can only endure, your mind can only endure as much as your seat will. I understand that. I understand people. Ooh, but I have a real problem when it's like this. <laughs> Hello? Unless you have a physical condition and you can't help yourself. But listen to what he's saying here in the Word of God. He said, the Lord's coming, less coming suddenly. And how many of you know when Jesus comes, it's going to be suddenly? He's not going to say, just want everybody to know, 15 minutes, the Lord's coming. Huh? No. It says, lest coming suddenly, he finds you sleeping. And what I say unto you, I say to all, watch. Watch. Heard it all my life, preacher. Never have we lived in a time like we're living right now. How many of you thought, Three years ago, that everybody would be walking around with a mask on. Are you listening to me? How many of you ever dreamed of something like that? Pestilence. Diseases. Earthquakes like we're seeing. All of the signs of His coming. These have always been. There's always been things like this. But not like we're seeing now. It's like a woman in labor, as clo the closer she gets to birthing that child, more the labor becomes more intense. Amen. The pains are coming quicker and faster and harder before that baby is birthed. We've always seen these signs that we see in the Word of God, but we've never seen it like it's happening now. Amen. One thing right after another. This hurricane that hit Florida and came up through South Carolina, North Carolina, Virginia, into West Virginia. We've always seen these things happen. But we're seeing it happen more often. You know, we've got the bunch, bless your hearts. Oh, it's climate change. And how many of you heard them say, this is the worst storm we've had in 500 years? Well, were they saying it was climate change 500 years ago? That don't make any sense. We're seeing it happen because we're getting ready to see the coming of the Lord. And all of these things are happening, one right after another. Our eyes should be open. We should say, I'm not going to be left here. I'm looking for him. I'm going to watch. I'm going to pray. Watch out. He's coming. Are you listening? He's coming. Watch. Watch. Let me ask you this question. If he came in the next five seconds, would you go? Would you? Would you go if he came in the next five seconds? Well, I need a little more time in that, Pastor, to get things right. When he comes, it's going to be his lightning, the Word says. He comes, if he came right now, you know what you'd see up here? You'd see a sports coat laying here in a greasy spot. I'm going to be with the Lord. 
Hello? Are you listening? Are you ready? Are you looking? Do you get out of the bed in the morning and say, Maranatha, come quickly, Lord Jesus. This could be the day. This could be the day we could go to be with the Lord. Think about it. Are you asleep? Are you sleeping? Are you looking? He's coming back after those that are looking, watching, and anticipating his soon return. You know what they were preaching when I got saved in 1969? They were preaching, Jesus is coming. Hello? You know what they were preaching? When Jesus led his followers out as far as Bethany, lifted up his hands and blessed them, he was seen 40 days after his resurrection. You know what? He ascended into heaven. Angels stood there and said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? That same Jesus you've seen taken out of your sight, he's coming back in like manner. Come on. They were looking for him. They greeted one another with a holy kiss. Maranatha, Jesus is coming. We're living where people's senses have been dulled. We're living in a great falling away. Jesus is coming. Did you know what? The message I preach to you today could very possibly be the last message you ever hear. Wouldn't it be an awful thing that this was the last message you heard and you weren't right with God and you dropped dead and you had to stand before God, what could you say? Well, well I, I went to church. I, I gave money in the offering. But I wasn't born again. You listen to me? You'd have no excuse. The Lord would say, you remember on uh, Sunday, October the 2nd, 2022, you were there and the preacher preached on watch and you didn't, and I dealt with you and you didn't go to that altar and receive me. Depart from me, worker of iniquity. I know you're not. Prepare you for the devil and his angels. That's the way it's going to be, folks. You better watch and you better pray. Would you bow your heads? We're going to leave those live streaming. What have I got to say to you? You better watch. You better open your eyes. This thing's getting ready to wrap up. You don't have to have spiritual insight to see that. Look around you. What dangerous, perilous times we're living in. The things that's happening in this world. People dying of heart attacks. They can't take what's going on in this world. If you don't know the Lord, call that number this week. Give us the opportunity to introduce to you the King of glory. Our prayers are with you. And if you're not in church, get back in church. Don't let the devil sell you a bill of goods. Don't walk in fear. Get back in the house of God. We love you. Thank you for joining us. Join us again next time. God bless you. Heads bowed, eyes closed. God's here. He's here right now. Are you ready?